36-year-old Sylvia Dunstan wrote that song you just sang. The words are absolutely powerful, setting such a vivid contrast of who Jesus Christ is. When that refrain repeated itself, you are the everlasting instant. Those are, that's called a paradox. You would never put the word everlasting with the word instant. They, they seem to be so a contrast with each other. And there are other contrasts. In other words, uh, two words that she links together that from a very logical perspective, you would never even think about putting together. I, I know you're just saying it, but just humor me and, and go back to verse 1 and, and just read how two words are connected together. And so it begins. You, Lord, are both lamb and shepherd. Well, it's, how can that be? We, you either, you're either one or the other, but you can't be both at the same time, right? Keep reading. You, Lord, are both prince and slave. Well, how can that be? A prince rules and has command of slaves, uh, a, a slave simply follows orders, right? Keep reading. You, Lord, are both peacemaker and sword bringer. Again, how can that be? Either you come into a meeting because you want to make peace, or you destroy it by bringing a sword to the table. That is what the, the paradox of who Christ our King truly is. But then you come to that very next phrase. Of the way you took and gave. Taking and giving is also a paradox. But this morning it is the solution to everything that Jesus is. Jesus is both lamb and shepherd. Because he's the lamb who took away our sins. And yet he is the good shepherd who gave his life for his sheep. It seems like a paradox, but the solution is found in that both refer to Jesus Christ. Throughout all of history and throughout all of the pages of the Bible, there, the Bible always is talking about lambs and sheep. And shepherds, and you heard it repeated through the prophets, like uh, our reading from uh, Ezekiel, and even Jesus in John chapter ten refers to sheep and himself as the good shepherd. And yet this morning, we go to the very last book of the Bible that is still talking in the final chapters, the final words of Holy Scripture. It's still talking about the lamb and about the shepherd. The paradox finds its ultimate solution even for eternity because going into eternity is the lamb. And in heaven, you shall find your good shepherd. But first, the lamb who saves. Go to Revelation chapter 7. Um, we're going to look at verses 9 and 10 because it talks about Jesus as the lamb who saves. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes, and they were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Seven times. In the book of Revelation, you can find some form of that phrase. Uh, people from every tribe, language, uh, nation, and, and language are all in, in, in heaven. And someday, you know, when you, when you get, to, get to heaven and you look around there, um, you're, you're going to find out something that uh, all the people in heaven, uh, when you get there, they're not going to all look like you. They're not going to be part of one ethnic group. They're not going to be part of uh, uh, one nation, nor will they be part of uh, one single uh, denomination. Um, it's going to be uh, part of everyone. 
But what's fascinating about them isn't their skin color, what their biological background is, or what language people are going to speak in heaven. What's so unique about people in heaven is how they look. And, and so their description, people in heaven right now are, are wearing white robes. And white robes is a symbol of purity. Back in apostolic times, when people were converting from paganism to Christianity, on the very first day that they became members of a, of a church, uh, they were given a, a brand new white robe to wear. And it was meant to, to vividly show them of how from this moment on, from this day on, uh, you're going to be, you're putting on Christ uh, and you're going to be living a, a new kind of a life. And everyone is not just wearing white robes in heaven, but they're also waving palm branches, which is unusual until you find out that in ancient times that was a symbol of victory. And so there was a, an old ancient custom among early Christians that when a believer died, um, in the hands of that believer, they would put a palm branch, a, a symbol uh, not only of running and completing uh, the race of life, but also the hope of victory that is now theirs. And I know that this sounds maybe a little bit ridiculous, but did you catch something from verses 9 and 10 as well? There are no dead people in heaven. What, what's so interesting, it, it talks about all of these people who are gathered in heaven. They've been called out of the great tribulation of life and that stands from uh, so many different periods. But this whole collection of people that have uh, finally come out of it, uh, we're, we're told that, that they're standing. They, they're alive. There are no dead people believers in, in heaven. They're, they're standing in front of the throne, which makes you say, well, then what are they doing in front of that throne? Well, they're, they're not idly chatting. They're not gossiping. They're, they're not just looking around. But look at verse 10. We're told, they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. On this Good Shepherd Sunday, even the book of Revelation reminds us that we are saved by our God who sits on the throne and by the Lamb. And all the people who are in heaven right, right now are there not because of a single thing that they have done. They are simply there because of what the Lamb of God has done for them. He provided them salvation. He gave to them the white robes uh, that covered over their sinfulness. And so all people are standing before the Lamb of God, and they can't believe the fact that they are wearing white robes that Jesus has provided, and that is of, his, of Christ's righteousness. See, if you watched the Masters tournament last week, um, Jordan... You know that Jordan Spieth, uh, he, he lost. He took second place. He was last year's winner. And there's a, a master's tradition that uh, last year's winner helps this year's winner put on the coveted green jacket of the victor. And so can you imagine being Jordan and you won last year and you, you want that jacket so bad, and yet you just have to help the new winner to put it on. See, that, that scenario, that, that competition, is, is so, that, it's an antithesis of, of what Jesus is and what Jesus gives. Jesus loves being able to take the white robe of righteousness, and if you can imagine, he loves being able to put it on every single human being. Over and over again, he says, here, this is the coveted white robe of my righteousness, and I want you to have it. This is my gift uh, to you. This is the Lamb of God who laid down his life for his sheep. But the Lamb of God is not just a lamb. He also just happens to be uh, the good shepherd. Uh, one of our readings this morning was from John chapter 10, which is the great, uh, call it the Good Shepherd chapter of the Bible, in which Jesus promises to be a good shepherd, not a bad shepherd. A, a bad shepherd is one who doesn't care about the sheep, and as a matter of fact, uh, he doesn't watch over them, and he doesn't even care if they die. 
A good shepherd is one who loves his sheep, is constantly and daily watching out for them, taking care of all of their needs. Uh, A good shepherd is someone who knows every single one of his sheep by name and calls them out. And then only this good shepherd can give to you this. And it's from John chapter 10. Jesus says, I give them eternal life. Only this good shepherd can say, to say to his sheep, you don't have to be afraid of death. No one is going to snatch you out of my hand. And here's the proof. And you go to Revelation chapter 7. Look at verse 13. Then one of the elders asked me, he said, you know, these in white robes, who are they? Where do they come from? And I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb shed for the forgiveness of sins. But blood is red. Take a white robe and wash it in blood. It's going to come out red. But when our sins are forgiven, uh, we are holy. And the symbol of holiness and purity and forgiveness is pure white. Last week, um, um, a 19-year-old was shot and killed in Daytona Beach, and it was, it was tragic for family and for friends because when, when someone old dies, there's something that we, we, we can accept that a, a, a little, little bit more. That is to be expected, but, but uh, when someone who is young, it's hard to deal with that loss because it just doesn't make sense. It's one thing to say old sheep, they finally pass away, but, but when, when a lamb does, and that's the paradox. That's another paradox that we know to be true, and that is the paradox between life and death. We know only one thing right now, and that is we know only about life. None of us have ever died. And so we want to live. We want to live forever. And yet the fact and the truth is the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. People die because people sin. And the fact that there were, that there were so many who were gathered at a, at a funeral home for a memorial service of, of a 19-year-old, it, it proves that we have this this internal code uh, built into our soul between what is right and, and, and what is wrong. And death violates that code. And so that's why our hearts hurt. Because inwardly we so desire uh, life and, and yet we have to live with death because of that truth that is called sin. We live in a sinful world. Sin in others and sin in us. That's what makes our lives tough. And this is the truth. God does, what our minds oftentimes wrestle with is the fact that, that God is not unfair. And God does not uh, take teenagers away from their parents But it is God who gets teenagers and their parents through problems and their grief. God is the one who directs and he provides and he loves. I uh, simply simply trust and I rely and I look to my God. Because only this God is the one that can give us hope that there is going to be ultimately Uh, triumph even in the midst of tragedy listen God does not owe us anything God does not owe us life and God does not owe us forgiveness but if you look at Revelation chapter 7 this is the good shepherd who gives us life who gives us forgiveness as his gift And, and, and so to be able to draw attention to the fact that that at this 19 year old's memorial service Look at his foundation of faith. Look at the waters of his baptism. Look at the white robe of righteousness that Jesus Christ gave to him at his baptism. And then remember this, that he is now one of those that's being talked about in Revelation chapter 9. 
He has come out of the great tribulation. He has washed his robe and made it white in the blood of the Lamb. Jesus is ultimately the only one that you need this morning. Only Jesus. Because for Jesus, his Lamb's work is done. He's completed it successfully. The victory is our. But his good shepherding work continues even today. And the ultimate shepherding that he does is to finally bring us home in heaven. And that, would you believe that is uh, one of the most asked questions in 21 years of ministry that I get asked? Is, uh, hey pastor, what will heaven be like? And tell me what I'm going to do up there. And usually when kids ask me uh, that question, uh, invariably I will remember uh, verse 15. Um, well, here they are in heaven. They are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night uh, in his temple. And right there, you should just see the looks on, on kids' faces as they say, oh, come on, man. Because they look at that, oh, I got to, you know, I'm, this, they think that heaven is going to be like uh, uh, going to, to like unending Sunday worship. Oh, tui. Like, now all I'm going to be doing is worshiping in his presence, and, and that, i gotta, I got to do that. It's tough enough going one hour, but 24 hours for eternity. And that's usually where I have to say, the only reason why you're saying that and even thinking of heaven in that way is, is because uh, you're sinful. I said, and that's the difference between heaven and earth. In heaven, heaven is a sin-free zone. You're not even going to be thinking that way. Nobody, nobody in heaven right now uh, thinks that way. As a matter of fact, look at the paradox, the contrast between earth and heaven. And uh, uh, this is what John writes in verse 16. Uh, never again will they hunger. And never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. In other words, things that seem like such a problem right now, or problematic in your life right now, uh, they, they will no longer be a, a problem in heaven. And do you know why? Look at verse 17. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eye. Heaven is, heaven is going to be the exact uh, opposite of everything that you're experiencing here on earth. And it says... In, in what ways? Well, no more hunger, uh, p pain, or, or thirst, or suffering, no more tears or, or, or sorrow. So just think about that. What makes you, what makes you suffer right now? What, what brings tears to your eyes? Now think about heaven, and, and now there's, there's no more worries. There's, there's no crying in heaven. It's not because it's outlawed. It's not because it's forbidden. It's just that uh, the... The, at, the atmosphere of heaven is so holy, not even a single microbe or, or germ can endanger that kind of perfect happiness. Uh, it's going to be, really, think of heaven as this way. Heaven is not just what you, you hope and wish that it could be, but, but heaven is the absence of everything that hurts and causes you pain right now. So think of heaven in that way. Right now, heaven is a place where once you get there, there is a no more suffering. Heaven is a place where there are no more horse pills or medications. Heaven is a, is a place where um, there are no more tough days. Every day that you wake up and it's, and it's totally easy. Heaven is a place where there is a no anxiety. There's no bill paying. There's no more um, uh, nervousness, no more depression. There's no funeral homes in heaven. There's no doctors. There's no hospitals. The, the fact that, that the early Christians, they picked up on that picture of what heaven is going to be, and they contrasted it to everything that you and I were going through and the pain and the sorrow and the, and the tears that we feel so much right now. Maybe that's why uh, whenever there was conversion that happened in the early Christian church, they always made sure that it looked ahead to the future goal of heaven. Um, I'm but a stranger here, right? Because heaven is my home. The apostle Peter said it this way. He said, you were like sheep going astray, 
but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And so when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. And that's why the Bible refers to Jesus as the great shepherd of the sheep who makes his people complete by, by working, not just as the Lamb of God, which he's already done, but his work that he continues to do, which is to be your good shepherd for people of all generations. And stanza one of the song that you just sang, it, it said, the, the very last phrase said, you, uh, you whom we both scorn and yet we crave. And how true that is. We get so wrapped up in life in this world that oftentimes we forget all about him. And yet, in our time of greatest need, the shepherd is always there. At our time when we're hurting the most, then we turn to him and we crave what he can give us. Truly, ask yourself this. Does not every soul, including my soul, need a shepherd? And that's why the Bible reminds us on this Good Shepherd Sunday that our eternal salvation, it comes from the Lamb, and that Lamb just happens also to be the Good Shepherd. Uh, praise God this morning that your Lord, whom you believe in, He is both your Lamb and He is your Shepherd for all eternity. Amen. Amen. <laughs>